sealed up, you know. It has been all this time. So you've come prepared. I know word for word everything Jeff said at the hearing. And this is the only place I can verify those words. Well, Mr. Kassab? Call me Freddy. Freddy? Go right ahead. If you're going into the children's room, you see, things are pretty much as they were that night. And, uh, I mean, there's still some blood stains in there, you know. I can't figure it. No. What? Some threads from his pajamas were found over there beneath the bed. How the devil did they get there? Unless, of course, he was standing there or kneeling there when he wrote pig on the headboard. All right, under the bush there, they found one of the knives in the ice pick. And the club was found right about here. Why would four murderers fleeing the scene of a crime stop to put their weapons under a bush right outside the back door? Those Valentine cards, were they there that night? That's right. Standing just the way they are now? Just like that. And he fought them off in this room? Right. Some fight. calls for help two minutes apart. In those two minutes, he claims that he looked out the back door, went to the bathroom to check his wounds, washed his hands, checked Colette for any signs of life, gave her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, checked the kids, Kimmy and Christy, and then he staggered into the kitchen, maybe to wash his hands again. Impossible. 
absolutely impossible. No one could perform all those functions in a two-minute time span. Now, I'm asleep. I wake up hearing Colette screaming. I see you standing over me. I describe you. The blonde, the floppy hat, the man with the sergeant stripe on his sleeve. I describe everything. How? How, for God's sake? This light was off. I can't recognize either one of you in this light. Thank you, gentlemen. Are you satisfied? Yes, I am. I know now that my son-in-law murdered my daughter and my two grandchildren. I know it. Look, I might as well tell you, Freddy. I, I mean, I hope you realize that what we do have is still circumstantial. It's only fair to warn you. If you plan to pursue it, it could be a very long haul. Freddy? It's OK. I plan to live a long time. And I have the patience of Job. Dear Joe, I'm beginning to put my life back together. My work at the hospital and a relationship with the most sensual woman I've ever seen. She works for one of the yacht dealers in the area. The first time I saw her, she looked very prim and proper. Had her hair up and there was no real hint except in her eyes of this incredible beauty and, and tremendous sensuality. Walking into the showroom, she stared at me and I stared at her. Our fates were sealed from that moment. Two sort of passionate people, neither of which has had a very smooth life. And when we're alone, making love takes up a large proportion of our time. Watch it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Next weekend, I thought we'd go down to San Diego. Be taking a medical conference, some recreation on the side. Sounds great. An old Green Beret friend of mine, he's going to be at the conference. How long were you in the Green Berets, Jeff? Oh, well, not too long. About a year. Did you do any of that John Wayne stuff? Do it. I'm a doctor. I'm, uh, I'm a healer. That's, that's what I chose to be. What was she like? Who? Call that. I loved her very much. I can't imagine it. It must have been such a horrible thing. All that you've gone through these yeah. last... Jeff, I'm sorry. No, no, but... it's all right. Look, I want you to know, I think you're a wonderful person and a wonderful doctor, and if there's anything I can possibly do... Just being here, just... being near me, just understanding. I do. If I could help you forget. But I'll never forget. Never. It's the Justice Department. What? They don't give a hoot in hell about justice. Is it too much to ask after two years and ten months of reinvestigation to want the case to go forward? Well, it's going forward, by God. If I have to twist the arm of every congressman in Washington. Yeah. Where are you going, Freddy? I'm going to start twisting. Dear Mildred and Freddie, 
Christmas is a time for memories and nostalgia, the time for being touched by the spirit of love. That is, above all, a time for remembering one such as you. Merry Christmas. Love, Jeff. How big is it? It's big as me. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful, Mommy. It's so pretty. Thank you, Mommy. <laughs> you like it. Is there anything more? Is that all? It certainly is more. They just didn't have time to deliver it, that's all. Still down at the department store in the window. You want to go down and take a look at it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, come on. Let's get your clothes on. We'll all go down and have a look, OK? Come on. Kim, you go with Mommy, all right? Jack, what is it? I'm not telling you. No, Try. What is it? Oh, Daddy, Your very it's own Jack. pony. How do you like that? Oh. Let's jump up there. Come on. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Right. Hey, what do you Daddy, say? Daddy, Come on. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> right, them cowboy. Oh. Get up. Come on. Oh, oh, you know what this is, Colette? What do you want this is the about? beginning of the farm you're going to have in Connecticut someday. With horses and dogs <laughs> and a beautiful oh, house. And all the wonderful things in life you deserve. Clef? <laughs> someday. <laughs> Christy, you, you hang on tight to Kimmy, OK, so you don't fall. Oh, we're all right? Oh, <laughs> fucking <laughs> ground coal. <laughs> oh, it's so sweet. <laughs> Oven's ready. We got the duck coming up. Ooh, that looks nice. Honey, I'm gonna ask the Kalen's over for a drink. Oh, but we just put the duck in, and if they stay on it... Oh, it's Christmas, for Pete's sake. Come on, make us a drink, okay? Hey, Jeff, I don't really think we should. Oh, they're coming over. It's fine. Make us a drink, okay? We need some ice. Right. Where's the ice pick? I got it. Jeff, telephone. I think it's your ex-father-in-law. Freddy? Yeah, I want to know one thing. What is it you want? I mean, are you trying to crucify me? I don't know what you're talking about. I'll tell you for one thing what I'm talking about. A certain Long Island Register article under the headline saying, Parents live to see a killer caught. You're absolutely right. We think of nothing else, nothing. Is that why you made up lies about me having sexual relations with someone during the Article 32 hearing? They're not lies. I believe them. Why? Because the CID told you it was true? Absolutely. Is that what you're telling me? I am telling you, Jeff, that I have a copy of an affidavit from the girl. Oh, Fred, I'm, I'm really disgusted. I mean, you will believe anything. You will grasp at any straw. I mean, you could have 14 affidavits from people, and if you think that makes any difference, you're crazy. I don't know what you're telling me, but if you're saying that I slept with a girl there every night in my room, that is, that is the most absurd, insane comment. I hope you put that out, Fred, because if you have the audacity to believe something like that, then you deserve everything you get. I talked to the girl, Jeff. I don't care, Freddy. You talk to the girl. What the hell does that mean? If you think I'm going to bare my soul to people like you after what I've been through, you've got another thing coming. You're hurting innocent people. You're making yourself into a martyr, Freddy. You just won't let go. Time will tell. It's almost 6 o'clock. They're going to be closing soon. Now, we've got to get to the cleaners before they close, too. I think maybe I've got something. Now, you know that lawyer, Khan, who talked about a citizen's complaint? Yes. Well, the thing is that if... 
If we can get a return of presentment from a grand jury, then the Justice Department will be forced to prosecute. But how do First, I... we file a citizen's complaint charging him with three counts of murder. And then what we do is we... Then we... We take it to the chief judge of the Eastern District of North Carolina along with sworn affidavits on the facts of the case. We're going to do it, Mildred. I tell you, we're going to do it. We're going to stop this monster. It's the last thing we ever do. Let me sort of warn you, Freddie. Victor Warheide is... Well, he's a little eccentric, but he's still the best lawyer they've got in the Justice Department. Through there. Come in. Victor, I'd like you to meet Freddy Kassab. Hi. Sit down. Uh, if you don't mind us getting right to the point, have you reached any conclusions yet? Yeah. I've reached one conclusion. The Justice Department has dumped all this crap on my desk. Sit down. It seems a citizen's complaint's been filed, and the criminal division has asked me to review it with a view toward grand jury action. So what do we have here? I'll tell you what we don't have. We have no confession. We have no apparent motive. We have no witnesses. And any attempt to convict this man is unlikely to succeed. That is exactly what Mr. Kassab has been hearing for years. And yet... And yet you both think you have a case. We do. What are you getting out of this? May I answer that? There are a few of us, sir. Mr. Murtaugh happens to be one of them, thank God. Who are guided by one thought, and that is the butchered bodies of a pregnant woman and her two little girls. Paul. This is Paul Stumbaugh. He's chief of the FBI's chemistry and physics branch, Freddy Kassab. How do you do? Paul, well, I told them I felt the most damning evidence would have to be McDonald's pajama top. Yes, yeah, somewhat uh, difficult to explain, but damning nonetheless. Suppose you make it less difficult for us. I'll try. This is a blue pajama top similar to the one that he wore. Now, I hold it up in front of me to keep off the blows of my attackers, but they come at me with an ice pick. The pajama top is punctured over and over. We carefully examine those puncture holes in the actual pajama, every one of them under the microscope. And? Not one single puncture showed the kind of ragged tearing that would occur if the pajama top had been in motion. Each and every hole was a small, clean puncture. The pajama top had to be stationary at the time? In my opinion. Where? Well, it was found on top of Colette's body. You think he stabbed her there, through the pajamas? She had 21 ice pick wounds. We discovered that if you fold the actual pajama the way it was found on top of her body, the clean cut holes match the pattern of the 21 ice pick stabbings on her body. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kassab. No, it's all right. The pajama top gives us another piece of very conclusive evidence. He said that the pajama was torn before he went back to see Colette. Torn in the struggle with the hippies. We can prove that Colette's blood was on it in a perfect pattern before the pajama was torn. Next. 
Christus. Some coffee, Dr. McDonald. No, no thanks, Debbie. What time is it? Oh, half past three in the morning. <sighs> Feels like it. Doctor, we just heard about your going back east to a grand jury, and, well, we just want you to know that we all firmly believe in you. It just seems impossible that they can still be hounding you after all these years. Well, it's, uh, it's a personal vendetta, my ex-father-in-law. Must be very painful for you. Thanks. We wish you the best, Doctor. The very best. Thank you. Uh, doctor? Doctor? I just called his folks in Seattle. I told them he was going to be okay. Well, the bullet deflected. I miss his heart by a fraction of an inch. He's only been on the force a couple of months. Listen, I, uh... Well, I just want to thank you personally for pulling him through. You know, they told me it was going to be a 50-50 thing coming in here, and... Anytime, Sergeant. I do mean that. Any hour of the day or night, if any one of your officers gets hurt in the line of duty, I want to be there. Okay? God bless you, Doc. You're one in a million. Earlier in the day, you testified that as a babysitter for the McDonald's, you thought that they had an ice pick in the house. Are you sure right now that they had an ice pick in the house? Yes. In my experience as a news reporter, drug addicts would never say acid is groovy. Groovy is just not a word people doing acid would use. And also, four people doing acid couldn't organize a trip to the toilet, let alone organize the murder of three people. A copy of Esquire magazine was found in your home with articles about the Sharon Tate murder. Did you discuss these articles with a friend? What happened was we were just sitting around talking and we thumbed through the magazine and that was it. That's all there was. And now, for some reason, this becomes an important thing in my life. I ask you again, Doctor. Will you submit to a polygraph or sodium amytal examination? My lawyer says that it would be dangerous for me to undergo a sodium amytal exam. This is a drug which essentially causes a person to relive the episode. This is not merely a recalling, but it is a complete reliving with most or all of the emotional feelings, anguish, grief, to the experience after... <laughs> Take your time, doctor. Take your time. Can't be helped, Freddy. We've got to have the hair samples. We've got to know if that hair found in Colette's hand was her own, Jeff's, the kids, or someone with a floppy hat. Gentlemen, the hair was her own.
Another thing, I have a clipping here about the graves of my wife and children, and I'd like for the grand jury to see it. It is indicative of how this case has been handled from the beginning to the end, because no one asked the husband or father whether these graves should be opened. What you did was, as you sleazy jerks paid off six grave diggers, $50 a piece, not to say anything. Doctor, what exactly is a paranoid type psychosis? This is when an individual becomes convinced that his particular view of reality is absolutely the only correct view and that anyone who disagrees with it is completely out of touch. Now, doctor, in regards to this particular case, the MPs who came to the home and found an emergency situation, the CID agents who in conducted the investigation, the medics who came and gave first aid, the hospital staff who treated him. Might his psychological pattern be expressed by the attitude, they're all bunklers, they're idiots, they're stupid, they're jerks, they didn't do things right, they're incompetent. Yes. Also during the psychological testing I conducted, his behavior was quite inappropriate revealing an attitude I would call paranoid-like. Can you explain that, please? It was the conveying of contempt, of disparagement for the examination, the examiner, the whole process that was going on at the time. My brother's getting a raw deal. Is that it? This whole thing's a sham, a farce. Is that it? This whole thing is rigged from the beginning. Is that it? Look, as far as you and all these investigators, I'm on the 20th floor, and I think you're a pile of garbage. I didn't know they piled it that high. I object to the badgering of my relatives to get some testimony. One of my relatives was told that the only time that I broke down and cried was discussing the sodium amytal examinations. That's absurd. Uh, who allegedly made that statement? That creep who works for you, that little viper. All right. That little guy who, who doesn't have the politeness to introduce himself or doesn't know any of the social amenities. Now, I take it as a doctor you collected medical supplies. I had a large hall closet that had a lot of medications, first aid equipment. Did you have any pills that some people refer to as, as uppers or, or downers, and so on and so forth? It was a bottle of Escatrol diet pills, which, which had some amphetamines in it. And Colette was using Benadryl occasionally for sleep. Look, we know McDonald had extramarital affairs that Colette was unaware of. So what? Huh? Extramarital affairs did not prove the man's a killer. He lied about it. Just like he lied about going off with a boxing team to Russia when he just wanted to get the hell away. So he lied to his wife. Who doesn't know him then? Look, the guy was on a 24-hour shift the night before the murders. Then he put in a full day at the office. So maybe he was taking pills to keep himself going. Too many of those and you're just asking for trouble. He was tested for drugs at the hospital. They found nothing. Wait a minute. They tested him for heavy drugs, but not amphetamines. We don't know that he ever took them. We don't even know what he and Colette were fighting about. What set him off? His infidelity? The kid waiting to bed? It's possible. It's not a motive, Brian, that we can prove. We don't have a motive. Excuse me, gentlemen. If we could, for the moment, put aside the motivation, I'd like to point out how fortunate we are. Fortunate? Only one family in a thousand, ten thousand, have different blood types. The father, the mother, the children, all different. And because of this, we are able to determine what happened, even if we haven't the why. It's not complete. It'll never be complete without the why. And I can promise you this, Jeff McDonald will never tell us. See you later, gentlemen. Hold on, I'll walk you downstairs.
the blood. What's that? You mentioned the blood types. That's right. Colette type A, Jeffrey type B, Kimberly type AB, Kristen type O. Don't you think that's too confusing to a jury? On the contrary. It means that we can trace McDonald's movements throughout the apartment. It means that we know Colette left the master bedroom. Do it. What? Take your A's and your B's and let me know what happened. I want to know exactly what happened. Oh, no, that can't be done, Freddy. Not exactly. But uh, given our chemical analysis, I can come about as close as anyone can get. Good. Tell me. Look, are you sure you really want me to? Tell me. Here. Started here in the master bedroom after Kristen had wet the bed and gone back to her own room. The hairbrush that was found by the side of the bed, it's quite possible that the very first moment of violence came from your daughter hitting McDonald with that hairbrush. We know that he had a slight abrasion above the left eye when he was admitted to the hospital. At this point, Colette was bleeding from the nose and the mouth, and the blood was spreading out all over Jeffrey's pajama top. The pajama top was ripped open and the pocket was torn off. And it was here we found the largest number of pajama threads and fibers. She found a knife nearby and used it to protect herself, making cuts in the pajama top, dull tearing cuts that would be made by a knife of this type. Kimberly heard the struggle going on and came into the room. A neighbor was awakened by her dog barking, said she heard a woman screaming and a child crying. He uh, had the club now, and as he swung it, he may have accidentally hit Kimberly on the left side of the head. It was a blow of tremendous force. We know that because of the large amount of A.B. blood found in this location. Colette was struck at this same time. While she lay unconscious on the floor, he picked up Kimberly and carried her back to her room, which accounts for Kimberly's blood being on his pajama top. He was still wearing the torn and blood-stained pajama top and 19 threads of it were found in the child's bed covers. Somehow, he got the idea about the hippies, most likely from Esquire magazine. In order to give the impression that multiple assailants were involved, multiple weapons were necessary. He put on a pair of surgical gloves and armed himself with the old hickory knife. And then in Kristen's room, the child was stabbed in her back and also in the chest. Several threads from his pajama top were found in her bed. And then Kimberly was clubbed again and stabbed. Want me to go on? Do you want to hear it? I have to hear it. Colette regained consciousness and, in a state of shock, went into Kristen's room. It was there that Jeff found her again and beat her furiously with the club. Her A-type blood was found on the top sheet of the bed there and spattered on the wall.
In the master bedroom, he collected the bedspread and sheet. On the way out of the room, carrying her, he left two footprints on the bare floor in Colette's blood, prints that match his left foot. While moving Colette, his pajama top became soaked with her blood. He left bloody fabric impressions in her blood type from his pajama top on the sheet. He also left a fragment of torn surgical glove. Then he went out and found the club again and the knife. And then? God knows what kind of maniacal rage seized him then. But he came back to Colette and struck her a vicious blow with the club, leaving a scrape mark on the ceiling as he swung it over his head. Then he stabbed her repeatedly with a hickory knife. Several threads from the pajama top were found under the word pig. Then he threw the top onto her to explain why it was so bloody. He stabbed Kristen many times with the ice pick, presumably before he went back to Colette in the master bedroom. And then, and this is very important, when he used the ice pick on Colette, the pajama top was over. The ice pick went through the pajama top over and over, leaving smooth cylindrical holes. He ripped off the gloves and four fragments of them fell about the room. Fragments that were identical to the gloves, the surgical gloves, found in the kitchen cabinet. He now had to set up the living room to make it appear that there had been a struggle. As a surgeon, he knew just where to place the self-inflicted wound. It would prove that he was attacked. It was nothing, of course, compared to what his family had suffered. Many drops of McDonald's blood were found in the sink. He um, wiped the weapons clean and put them outside in the backyard. The bath mat had the bloody impressions of a wiped ice pick and knife. At 3.40 a.m., he picked up one of the two phones and called for help. That's about it. Freddy? save my family <laughs> and then you, you come in here and you tell me that someone's folded the top of my pajama top and put some little probes through it and that means that I killed Colette and these arguments about other women are absurd I slept with a lot of women but it doesn't mean anything it's never meant anything to me I never chased girls in California and yet I, I must have slept with 30 since I've been there, but because I don't spend the rest of my life, you know, praying on the graves, you tell me that I don't love my family and that I must have killed them, and that is not true. It's a lot of crap. I didn't kill Colette. I didn't kill Kimmy. I didn't kill Christy. I, g I gave them mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. I loved them. I love them now. And you can, you can take all your evidence and you can shove it. Hello. 
Brian, what have you got? What do you hear? Has the grand jury made a decision yet? Oh, I see. Well, the moment you hear anything, let me know, will you? What? Oh. Well, give them our best. That was Brian Murtaugh. Seems like the 23 grand jurors are still trying to make up their mind whether there should be a trial or not. Five months of testimony, over a hundred witnesses, and they still can't make up their How mind. How is Mr. Uh, Warheide? Not too well, I'm afraid. But he's more anxious than ever to bring this to trial. Well, I still thank God he was at the hearing. Hearing? Always hearings. Well, I want a trial. He's got to be brought to trial. Freddy, you can't expect the jurors to make up their minds overnight. Overnight. We've been waiting for five years. Hi. How'd it go? Terrific. Beautiful day. Bernie Siegel called. Any message? Said he'd call you back. Let's go get something to eat. I'm starving. <laughs> Mother, you're too much. Do you know that? And I think I know what that is. <laughs> you got it. And tomorrow I'm. Well, gonna I'm going make... to San Diego tomorrow. I'm giving three lectures on child abuse. There's a hospital administrator there. He wants me to uh, you know, work out a program. Jeff. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Jeff. It's Bernie. I, I tried to reach you earlier, but. Uh... Yeah, my mom told me. What's up, Bernie? Well, I just wanted to get to you before anyone else. I mean, so you'll understand exactly what's going on. You see, uh, the grand jury has finally decided to... Wait a second, Bernie. What? Hold it. Dr. McDonald, FBI, I'll have to ask you to come with us. You've been indicted for murder by the grand jury of the Eastern District of North Carolina. You'll have to come with us. Jeff? Jeff, are you there? Can you hear me? So you're out of the army now, huh? I'm into the arms of the Justice Department, full time. Well, they don't know how lucky they are. They've got a first-rate lawyer, and nobody knows it better than I do. Come on, let's have a cup of coffee. Ryan, I tell you, I'll never be able to thank you enough. Look, Freddie, I'm, I'm afraid I got some bad news for you. Bad news? What do you mean, bad news? We've got him, haven't we? He's going to trial. The fact is, he's appealing for dismissal of charges on the basis of not receiving a speedy trial. Well, what do you mean? Well, the idea is to make it look as though it's too late in the day to try him now. Well, what are they talking about? It took us this long to get a grand jury indictment. I know that, Freddy, but he's also making an appeal on double jeopardy. Double? He's never had a trial, only hearings. He's out on bail, Freddy. He's free. And he will remain free as long as his lawyers have any recourse left to them. How many weeks will that take? The truth is, it could take months, even years. I'm sorry. What does War Heidi have to say about all this? War Heidi? You haven't heard. Last Thursday, he collapsed on a sidewalk near his home. Heart attack. He's dead, Freddy. Freddy, I'm not finished with this case yet. Hey, how about that cup of coffee? Wait a second, Bernie. I, I don't think I'm hearing this right. I don't, I don't think I'm getting this. 
You mean you... You're not saying the indictment's been dismissed? Jack, come on. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Bernie, that's terrific! I still... I can't hardly believe it. Yeah. It... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. You bet. They said they'd like to see us Friday night for dinner, but... Well, I, I told them I didn't know your Just schedule and... Just we can't make it. Why? I mean, but Freddie, we turned them down last Just month. Just tell them we're too reason. busy. My information, Freddy, how long do we remain busy? Freddy, I I'd like to know how many more months and months do we go on like this? What do you mean? You know very well what I mean. I, d I, I don't like what's happening any more than you do. I think it's absolutely appalling. But if you're just going to let it tear you apart and not do anything about it... Maybe I am. What do you mean? I've obtained a gun permit. Oh, dear God. I'm not going to let him get away with it. If the courts don't do... Freddie, have you really gone mad? The, the courts... All right, all right, the courts. Now, he appealed to the courts, and so can we. The courts take forever. So you just give up? I'll never give up! But I tell you... Then appeal to the courts, Freddy. Do it! Are you willing to go through this again? Yes. Take all the horror, the misery, the delay... Yes, everything? yes, I am willing. If you'll excuse me, I've got some letters to write. Letters? U.S. Attorney General, U.S. Solicitor General, Judiciary Committee of the House and Senate, the Grievance Committee of the American Bar Association. And you know, while I'm at it, I may as well write a letter to the United States Supreme Court asking for a petition to bring Jeff McDonald to trial. And in case I haven't mentioned it to you lately, I love you very much. Dr. McDonald? Yes. I'm Joe McGinnis. All oh, right, right. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Excuse me. How about some coffee? Great. You have to forgive me. I'm still in a state of shock. It's beyond my comprehension, anyone's comprehension, how the Supreme Court can now decide to put me through this after almost 10 years. Yes, I certainly understand. That's why I'm so interested in the case. It's Freddie Kassab, of course, my ex-father-in-law. He has finally got the trial that he really wanted, and now I suppose the only thing left in his deranged mind is to see me get the chair so he can be there to pull the switch. What? Why don't we sit down? You sure you wouldn't like something to eat with that? No, this is fine. I hear you're quite an expert on triple homicides. Bernie, my lawyer, Bernie Siegel, told me that. Oh, well, I, uh, I did write about such a case some years back. Most people don't seem to realize what I've been through. No, I don't mean the people at the hospital, the, the sisters and all. But this thing I live with is always there. I guess it must be. You, you ask a girl out to dinner and it's there. How much does she know? What should I tell her? You go to a medical conference, and it's there. What are they thinking? You understand what I'm saying? 
Of course. I'm just damn tired of being on the defensive. I mean, this is obviously going to be a horrible ordeal to... to have to relive the whole thing all over again. And yet, I am... Uh, I'm grateful for one thing, and that's that I'll, I'll be proven innocent at last. I need a writer to go right through the trial with me, to be there every moment. Now, are you interested in doing my story? Yes. I think it's a most unusual, really remarkable situation. But you understand that I'll have to be cut in. I mean, for some of the take. gentlemen, the Long Beach Police Officers Association and all the friends of Jeff McDonald are here this evening to give him our warm support. <laughs> included, included in your $100 tickets is a chance at the giant raffle, and we especially want to thank those individuals who put up $500 apiece to sit at the Golden Guest of Honor table with Dr. McDonald. Believe me, he has a wonderful reputation here in Raleigh, and I'll be right there assisting him throughout the trial. Is he anything like war, Heidi? <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't say that. Please have a seat. You folks just get into town today? Yes, this morning. Well, I sure hope you like it here in Raleigh. We think it's a mighty fine place to live. It, it's a lovely place. I just want you folks to know I'm going to do my very best for you. We appreciate that. How does this case look to you? I mean, compared to the other cases you've tried? The others? Oh. Well, truth be told, Mr. Kassab, this is the very first murder case I've ever prosecuted. You know, Mr. Blackburn was right. Raleigh is a lovely place to live. You know what I was thinking this morning? I was thinking back to the time we first knew Jeff. How he used to come over and mow our lawn in the summer. Yes, I remember very well. He used to shovel the snow off the driveway in the winter. They were just a couple of school kids. Just a couple of young kids dating. I used to drive them to the movies. I know. <laughs> I know. What the devil happened, do you think? Okay, Jeff, I, uh, I think we've seen enough, huh? Members of the jury, I must caution you again. 
that during your inspection of the scene of the crime, there is no conversation of any kind. Your comments should be reserved for your deliberations at the end of the trial. Okay, you have 20 minutes. By four, I want to hit the track and the barbells for dinner. That so called government expert today, that what is his name, Stamba? <laughs> Some expert. And all that garbage about matching footprints? What did he think he was proving? What a bunch of crap he's trying to sell. It could have been anybody's footprint. Thank God Bernie destroyed him later on. His testimony on the pajama top, though, he seemed to be making some points. Points? The judge had any guts at all. He threw this case out of court. I take it you're not too fond of the judge. God save us some Southern Republicans. And the Army, and the FBI, and most of all, the United States Supreme Court. Freddy, aren't you going to eat your dinner? No, I knew it. I was afraid of this going in. What are you talking about? What we need is a Victor Warhardy in that courtroom. Someone who can tackle Bernie Siegel head on. Mr. Blackburn just has a different approach, that's all. I'll say he does. Never raises his voice. So courteous. The utmost courtesy at all times. You know what I think? It's possible that Mr. Blackburn knows exactly what he's doing. Come on, Freddy, eat your dinner.
better. No, uh, well, I got it. You might think I'm a sadist. Yeah, you don't know. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Aha! I got it, huh? Hey. Hmm? When I get a chance? Yeah, well, be my guest. All right. Yeah. Mr. Stormbar, the government's expert, has stated that it's it's his conclusion that the holes placed in Jeffrey McDonald's pajama tops were made while the garment was stationary. Now, do you agree with that? No, I don't believe it's true. I conducted experiments in which holes from ice pick punctures were circular in appearance despite the fact that the target was in motion. Dr. Thornton, I would ask you if this is a reasonable facsimile of the pajama top you used in any of your experiments. Reasonable, yes. My question, sir, if you use this pajama top as a shield, as someone is trying to kill you with an ice pick, is it your opinion that the pajama could be used that way and still not sustain torn areas? I don't know. If I could... I would like to stand in front of you and placing great trust in Mr. Blackburn. I'm going to ask him to flail away at me with an ice pick. Uh, that was not part of the act, Your Honor. Uh, anybody got a Band-Aid? No, that's okay, that's okay. Now, Dr. Thornton, <clears throat> I would ask you to examine that pajama top and tell us what you see. I see a number of tears, and they do appear to be, in fact, tears. Uh, Mr. Murtaugh, do you need a doctor? <laughs> no, thank you. Mr. Oakland, come in, please. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, please sit down, Mr. Oakley. We have some coffee and some donuts here, if you'd like. No, thank you. May I have a diet soda? Well, absolutely. Miss Stokely, you know, of course, that there were four so-called hippies at the McDonald House the night of the murders. And you were questioned about your presence there. I just want you to know that whatever you say today... Miss Stokely? Uh, Miss Stokely, I just want you to know that whatever you say today will not put you in any difficulty whatsoever. This picture, this is the kitchen of the McDonald House. You see the calendar on the wall over there, right there? Well, that's been there now for nine years. It's waiting, just waiting for someone to tell us how to win the story. Elena? I can't help you. I wasn't in that house. I don't have anything to do with this. Believe me, Helena, if you just talk to me, tell me what happened, I can make this very short and very painless for you. I mean, for the sake of your own conscience. For the sake of that man in the courtroom, Helena, that man who has been made to suffer unjustly now for nine years. I can't say things that I don't remember. I have six witnesses. Now, you told them that you were there. You know how many drugs I've been on? 
I'm not going to sit here and say things that I don't remember. Besides, how do you know he isn't guilty? That was his flesh and blood, Helena. Now, what kind of father would do that to his own flesh and blood, hmm? Only somebody crazy or whacked out on drugs. Not acid. Maybe speed. Was he tested for drugs? Yes, Elena. I don't know what anybody else is capable of, but I know I'm not capable of that. Elena, no one is asking you to say that you did it. All you have to say is you were there, holding the candle, saying acid is groovy. You don't remember hurting anybody. Then you ran out the back door. Hmm? I wasn't there. I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't there! Jeff, can I see you for a minute, please? Yeah, just give myself a call. Now, right now, Jeff. Please. I want you to listen to me very carefully now. We're about to conduct the most important meeting we'll ever have. I know it's going to be very painful for you tomorrow when you go on the stand, but, but I want the jury to meet the victims. What? Yeah, I, I want to bring Colette, Kimmy, and Christy into that courtroom as living, breathing human beings. Look, I've got pictures here. Here's one of the, of the, of the kids in Halloween and sitting on your lap. Here's another one with the little girls on top of the pony and you standing beside them. I want that jury to meet a family. Not just a bunch of fibers and hairs and blood stains. It sounds like you're saying that I, I have to sit up there and prove my innocence. No, 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 no. I think we could rest this case today and win it. But I don't want to take the chance of one holdout juror making us go through all of this again. Which one? The ex-cop with the nasty eyes or, uh... The accountant who looks like he's president of the Ku Klux Klan, and I, I'm, a, I'm a black who just raped his daughter. Jeff, we got the drawers we wanted. Yeah, yeah, right. Jeff, that's exactly the kind of attitude you're displaying right now that I do not want the jury to see. I want you to look right past Blackburn and right at the jury. Blackburn's a weasel. He's got no guts at all. Look, Jeff, if the jury sees you're getting impatient with Blackburn, they might just feel you could have also been a little impatient with your own children, huh? Now, you don't have to be Lawrence Olivier, but be a little humble. Okay. Okay. Now, what do I say when, uh, they ask me why I went into the Green Berets? Well, Mr. Blackburn, I, I like to strangle people with piano wire. Jeff, you can't afford to come across as arrogant. Or as a homicidal psychopath, I suppose. Belligerence, huh? That's exactly how Warheide got at you with the grand jury. Hey, grand don't jury. tell me about Warheide, okay? He's a Nazi! Who the hell does he think he is? Himmler? Or Gurney? He's a Nazi! Pure and simple! He's a Nazi! He... Jeff, you, uh, you, you can't score any points with bitterness, you know. All right. I appreciate your advice. I just have one piece of advice for you on a direct examination. Hmm? Go easy on the pony, Bernie. With all those character witnesses, if they hear about that pony one more time, they're gonna puke. 
Dr. McDonald, where do you reside, please? In Huntington Beach, California. Dr. McDonald, are you married today? No. Is there some reason why you were not married? I can't forget my wife and children. Do you still have occasion to think about your family, even though it's been nine and a half years since they died? Every day. What sort of things did you and your family do together? We lived together. We shared most everything. We had a good life. We were all friends. We shared our life experiences. May I ask, Dr. McDonald, what are your strongest or most consistent memories of your wife, Colette? Colette was, she was very beautiful. And warm and intelligent. She was, uh, she was a great mother and wife. This is exhibit D96. What is it, please? It's a Valentine's card for my daughters. Would you be kind enough to read it to us and tell us whether it's signed and by whom? to a wonderful daddy. There are many daddies in the world. That's true, but the nicest by far is you, love, Kimmy and Chris. Do you recognize this photo? It's my daughter, Kristen. Is that how you saw her when you went into her room? All I remember is a lot of blood. And what did you do there, if you recall? I only recall doing one thing. And what was that? I, I patted her on the head. And I told her, I told her she'd be okay. This is the pajama top that you wore to bed that night. I have only your say so. Is it not the pajama top that you wore? I have no knowledge. Dr. McDonald, you did not receive any ice pick wounds to your hands or your wrist or the lower parts of your arms, did you? No. Why I did not, I cannot say. Did you struggle with Colette in the pajama top? I never struggled with Colette. Did she bleed on the pajama top before it was torn? Not to my knowledge. That night, did you ever touch the sheet or the bedspread found on the floor? I have no recollection at all. Are you saying that you did or you didn't? I'm saying neither. If the jury should find that there's a fabric impression on the sheet and Colette's blood type from your pajama top, do you have any explanation for that? If the jury should find? Uh-huh. No. Supposing the jury finds that your daughter, Kimberly's blood, 
type AB, was found on the blue pajama top, which you were not wearing, according to you, when you went in her room to see her. Do you have any explanation for that? Pure conjecture. Suppose the jury finds from the evidence that Colette's blood, type A, was found in Kristen's bed in massive amounts and on the wall over the bed. Do you, sir, have any explanation for that? Making a very large assumption that the Army CID knows how to type blood? No. Hey. Hey, General Tone is very, very good. I mean, just don't jump all over the army, though, Jeff, you know? I mean, I, I know you're tired of playing Mr. Nice Guy with him, but, but just hold back your feelings, because we're way ahead. We're way ahead. Dr. McDonald, did you place Colette on the sheet and care out of Christian's room? I did not. Did you, standing in the bathroom, take a scalpel or any instrument and inflict any injury upon yourself at the bathroom sink? I did not. And if the jury should find that the blood on the bathroom sink is your type blood, do you have any explanation for that? No. Suppose the jury finds from the evidence that there's no type B blood, yours, in the living room, where you say a struggle occurred and you were allegedly stabbed. Do you have any explanation for that? Only the obvious thing. The wounds weren't bleeding very much. You use the phone in the kitchen. Have any explanation why there was no blood on that phone? I had blood on my hands. I used the phone. I have no explanation for that lack of finding. Suppose the jury should find from the evidence that your wife and children were beaten and stabbed a number of times and the injuries that you sustained were not in any degree as serious as the ones they sustained, you are obviously still alive. Do you have any explanation for that? Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative. That is not a question at all. Mildred? You all right? I just can't sleep. Those photographs they showed us in the courtroom. I know, I know. Freddie, I don't think I can take another day. Just one or two, that's about all we have left. Freddie. Oh. Everything now depends on Blackburn's closing argument in the courtroom tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I suggest that the evidence will show that there was, in fact, a life and death struggle in that house that night. And at least two people were involved in it. Colette McDonald and her husband, Jeff McDonald. Now, we know from the evidence that Colette fought hard mighty hard before she died. You don't get both your arms broken standing there waiting to be killed. You just don't do it. Now, the defendant's theory of defense in this case has been sort of like this. I tell you a story, and you are to trust me. I'm telling the truth. I love my family. I love Colette. I love Kimberly and Kristen. Trust me, I couldn't have done this. I suggest to you that when you compare his story versus the government story, then you got to come down on one side or the other. Because the evidence in this case, if it shows nothing else, it shows that what the physical evidence says and what he says are not reconcilable. They're completely opposed. Do you recall we asked the defendant a number of questions? We asked if the jury found this or that. Did he have an explanation? Think about it for a moment. If you were on trial for your life, don't you think if you could explain it, you would? I would. I suggest that the defendant, perhaps in a frenzy, maybe defend off his wife, 
in one tragic, brief moment. So brief, lost control, and he came back with that club. As he did, he struck Kimberly, and he struck his wife. You know the words. Jeff, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? Just think how close that is. To Jeff, Jeff, why are you doing this to me? Ladies and gentlemen, if in the future, after this case is over, if you should think back on it again, I ask you to think back and remember Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen. They've been dead almost 10 years. 10 years that you've had, that I've had, and that the defendant has had, that they haven't. If in the future you should cry a tear, cry one for them. If in the future you should say a prayer, say one for them. When the government says, why doesn't McDonald explain these things, the answer is that Jeff McDonald is not responsible to answer any of these things. Their case is built upon assumptions that have no basis in reality whatsoever. This whole incredible fantasy that they call a case, it ought to make every one of us here angry that nine and a half years after the fact, that is exactly what is being called a case. It is just beyond belief. Who knows? That's right. Well, we, could, we could wait another hour, we could wait another week. Or two. Great. Sure. Thank you. Okay, okay, I will. Oh, did you get those reservations for me at the work? You and Miss Amato, it's all set, plus dinner reservations at La Scala. Jeffrey, I wish we'd have a little talk about how to handle the press after the acquittal. Maybe you should leave Raleigh immediately on the chartered plane. Whatever you think. I just found out they're going to give me a victory celebration when I get back to California. Might even rent the Queen Mary. I don't believe it. The jury's only been out for 42 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, Jeff, here's that present from your friends at the Long Beach Police Department. Thanks, guys. Right ahead, open it up. How do you like that, huh? Cops love them. Love them. Put it on. You, um, you really think he needs a bulletproof vest? You bet. There's someone out there who isn't gonna like a not guilty verdict. Uh-huh. Now it's over six hours. That's hardly any time at all. This could go on and on. They want us downstairs. They've reached a verdict. Members of the jury, have you agreed upon the verdict in this case? Yes, sir, we have. I am handed an envelope with a verdict form in it. Is this your verdict? Yes, sir. Madam Clerk, you may take the verdict. Would the jurors please stand? Members of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have. we have. How do you find as to count one? In the murder of Colette McDonald, is the defendant, Jeffrey R. McDonald, guilty or not guilty of murder in the first degree? Not guilty. 
guilty or not guilty of murder in the second degree? Guilty. How do you find as to the count two in the murder of Kimberly McDonald? Is the defendant Jeffrey R. McDonald guilty or not guilty of murder in the first degree? Not guilty. Guilty or not guilty of murder in the second degree? Guilty. As to the count three, in the murder of Kristen McDonald, guilty or not guilty of murder in the first degree? Guilty. guilty. Be seated, please. Your Honor, may the members of the jury be polled individually upon their verdict. Mr. Foreman, what is your verdict? Guilty. 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 Guilty.